Welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. I'm Sarah Isger, and I've got Mike Warren, John McCormick, and Steve Hayes here to, you know, break down the week that was, the week to come. There's a lot going on. So we're going to tick through that border bill, the once in future border bill, perhaps, the state of GOP politics based on what we learned from the border bill shenanigans, a little bit about what's going on with Trump's immunity claim that failed at the D.C. Circuit. And of course, a little not worth your time at the end, New Yorker edition. So, John, let's start with you. Can you just fill us in on what happened on the Hill this week where we actually thought we might solve the border crisis? Well, yeah, I think we never thought we were going to solve the border crisis because Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, made it clear weeks ago that he was going to kill basically anything that came out of the Senate. So it was always kind of a question of what exactly the Senate was doing here. We didn't get legislative text until Sunday night. Um, and within 24 hours, it was clear that this thing was on the rocks. It wasn't clear it didn't have 60 votes quite quite yet. Um, but eventually, you know, a, a bunch of the Republicans, even the ones who were um, amenable to the policies uh, that Senator James Lankford, a Republican of Oklahoma, had negotiated with uh, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, uh, they began to come up with reasons uh, such as, well, we haven't had enough time, and if a majority of the conference is against it, why are we going to take this political hit when Mike Johnson isn't even going to hold this hold a vote in this thing? Uh, so it, it it was blocked yesterday uh, on a 49 to 50 vote. It needed 60 to advance on the initial motion to proceed to debate. Um, in my personal opinion, you know, this was... Um, it was a really interesting on the policy, and, and David and Sarah did a really great job delving into the policies uh, that were being negotiated uh, behind closed doors. But, you know, we never really got a serious debate on this. Uh, you know, it was one of these things that was negotiated behind closed doors, but then just sort of sprung in everyone, and the first vote to proceed to debate uh, was just, you know, a few days later. So I guess the advocates of a people like Langford would say, well, we would still have two or three weeks to debate this. Um, but, you know, the, the exercise is never really getting to, to yes, to passing an actual bill that was going to make it out of Congress because, again, Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, made it clear that this thing was going to die in the House. So to my mind, it was more of an exercise of uh, uh, showing a dead body. OK, Republicans, you asked for um, a border security bill attached to a foreign aid to Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan. Uh, this is the best we can do. We spent four months negotiating in good faith. Uh, here's what rock ribbed Oklahoma Senator James Langford came up with. He's happy to explain this to all of you in detail and argue it. And there were, really wasn't much appetite for that. And so uh, we now stand in a situation where um, the, 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 they're now trying to pass a bill without uh, the border piece, uh, but there is now negotiations going on about whether there will be an open amendment process to this bill that would actually allow some amendments on, on border uh, pieces, uh, whether any of them has a chance of passing. I'm skeptical, uh, but that's where things stand right now. So that's a lot to unpack, I guess. That is a lot to unpack. Mike, two things. One, the idea that Donald Trump will get elected and then they'll get a better border deal seems silly for the very obvious reason that the reason the Democrats are willing to do a security only bill, that they're willing to compromise so much to even get to this point. I'm not saying the bill is perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but the reason this is by far the most we've ever seen Democrats come towards border security is because of the politics, meaning they think the politics is bad for them right now on the border. But once Biden's not in the White House, it won't be their problem anymore. There won't be an election right away. And so all of their incentive to compromise is gone the second Donald Trump becomes president. Why would they ever come back? Not to mention what just happened to them here. Like, you wouldn't compromise when our guy was president, but you think we're going to compromise when your guy's president? No, thank you. So that's one. Number two, McConnell and the Republicans in general, for that matter, said, hey, this is our moment to actually get a deal on the border in exchange for Ukraine funding. Hey, Jim Lankford, why don't you go negotiate this? He does, in good faith, gets a pretty, again, the most secure border deal that we've ever seen. I'm not saying it's perfect. And then they not only leave him out to dry. It's one thing to not vote for it and to say, look, look, you tried your best, but it wasn't good enough. We can't sign it. That's not what they're saying. They're saying this guy shouldn't be in the Senate anymore. He should be tarred and feathered. How dare he even think this is a deal? Why would anyone, any Republican, go negotiate any legislation 
ever, ever again on any topic. And this just furthers the like broken Congress where if you actually come to fix problems, come to compromise and make legislation, go somewhere else. You're going to retire because there's no room for you in Congress anymore. Um, so, Mike, I'm really optimistic about the future of the House. <laughs> Yeah, this is a real pick me up uh, to start uh, to start this podcast. So we're not going to fix the border and Congress is going to be rubble. Exactly. And there will be absolutely no trust uh, within yeah. the halls of Congress. Yeah, look, I, I totally agree with you. I think for, this is a lesson that for the time being, um, the the person in the Republican Senate conference who is tapped to negotiate some big legislation, like, uh, like they're the, uh, they're the fool. They're the one who is getting saddled with a no win job. Uh, and, and Lankford, you get the sense, um, you know, both from say John McCormick's reporting, talking with him and just his general, uh, uh, the way that, he, that Lankford has been talking about this in the days since the deal was released and, 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 and imploded. Um, he he seems to be he seems to have a kind of um uh devil may care attitude about it like he he's 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 kind of speaking out a little bit being like look i left it all on the table um what's your problem <laughs> to his colleagues uh in the senate and the house um look I, I to your to the first part of your of your statement sarah i do think there is there is so much of the problem for republicans on capitol hill it's not the entire problem but a big part of the problem is they don't understand the other side, the incentives that might be driving Democrats. Um, they have like an idea of what the Democrats are really up to in Congress. And it it generally inflates the, the Democrats' position and uh, a sort of political will and all these things. They think that sort of Democrats are all powerful and this is a this is sort of trickery and uh, and mind games in order to convince Republicans to go along with their with their great big elitist plan. But I think the reality is so much closer to what you said, which is that immigration has Democrats and and, and Joe Biden kind of over a barrel here. Um, they look weak. They need uh, to have some kind of compromise here because they also want Ukraine funding and 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 this other uh, foreign aid. Um, and Republicans act as if uh, they're they're in a better they're in a better position, and that Democrats are you know sort of uh, if they can only. If they can only push back harder, if Republicans can only hold the line just a little bit longer, um, then they can really get what they want. And what they don't realize is like is is the actual reality. Democrats have control of the Senate. They have the White House. They're also in kind of a bind. Um, this is the moment to compromise. Um, and, and they don't seem to be. Uh, understanding the reality of the situation. They're sort of living in the narrative, the simulacrum that that they're hearing back from uh from you know people in conservative media i saw this last night on fox um i believe it was laura ingram said something like don't let and i know we're talking about the the bill here uh but but the the failed impeachment of mayorkas uh the the dhs secretary um it failed this week as well which was a sort of a one two punch uh for republicans in the house and laura ingram said something to the effect of uh and i can't find exactly what she said she said don't let the these this failure uh you know let you think that republicans are losing republicans are winning the truth is they're not winning and and in fact they're they're letting victory slip through their fingers for reasons that for but Mike, can I can I, I I mean, in your um, tough assessment of of Republican maneuvering, I wonder if you're being too generous because your underlying assumption is that Republicans want to solve the problem. I don't think I, there's very little evidence at this point that that is true. The, the reason that that Republicans don't want this compromise is because they believe are more important the the putative leader of their party Donald Trump believes that this is advantageous for them they have they they do realize that democrats are in a spot on immigration right now with Demo democratic mayors democratic legislators attacking a democratic president because of the 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 situation on the border and and the inflow of migrants I don't know republicans are just saying we want the issue which is this the Sarah Isker assessment of the the problem from the beginning 
Okay, so here's my um, even darker, <laughs> darker take after my two dark takes to Mike. My dark take to you, Steve. Uh, everything Mike said, right? Like this is Republicans grasping defeat from the jaws of victory. You know who's going to get blamed for it? Joe Biden and the Democrats, because no one actually pays attention to internal Hill negotiations. And so while I think that the Democrats now are mistaken, they're like, look, it was a win-win for them. Either they get a border deal under Joe Biden and he gets to say he, you know, he fixed the border, or they get to blame Republicans for walking away from the negotiation table. They are sorely mistaken about that. Nobody is paying attention. It's a pox on both houses. And when you ask people, they're going to go with their sort of gut knowledge of the two parties, which is Democrats are weak on the border. Therefore, if the border is insecure, which it is, it must be Democrats fault. And there is nothing that Democrats can do about it, especially not with Joe Biden as their, you know, bully pulpit in chief who, you know, for instance, said he talked to Mitterrand last week. Yeah. And Helmut and Helmut Kohl uh, yesterday, apparently said that he y- yesterday said that he spoke, spoke to Helmut Kohl. So I, I think you might be right, Sarah. Um, and and this explains in part why, in addition to sort of Republican senators just losing their nerve um, and kowtowing to Donald Trump, I think this explains to a certain degree why they did what they did. The, the one question I have, and I agree with you that people aren't going to pay the kind of attention to the back and forth on Capitol Hill that Democrats seem uh, to, to hope they will. I'd say the, the, the one thing that complicates matters a little bit is that, you know, usually when you have a party and mass do something for political reasons, you know, in, in this case, scuttle the kinds of reforms, even though they weren't exactly the kinds of reforms that Republicans might have prescribed, they they are, you know, sort of by degree, the kinds of reforms that Republicans have been talking about for a long time. So they propose this, they try to link border security to, you know, Ukraine funding, all, all of these other issues that happens. And then they sort of scuttle their own best efforts in, in an argument that it's not quite good enough. When something like that happens, it can be sort of embarrassing on its own, but you don't usually have the party doing it acknowledge that they're doing it for political purposes. And what makes this different, maybe, I'm not sure it's different, is that Republicans have been quite open about the fact that they're doing this for political purpose. Donald Trump said Republicans should not do this because I want the issue, in effect. There was a Senate lunch, I think it was January 23rd, Mitch McConnell went into the Senate lunch and said, in effect, the political dynamics have changed here. Donald Trump doesn't want us to do this. We're not going to do this. Ted Cruz in the same Senate lunch, widely reported, said, we can't do this because we need to help the House majority of Republicans remain a majority. We don't want to do this for political reasons to Mike Johnson. Again and again and again, you've had Republicans in public quite transparently say, we are doing this for political reasons. Now, you have mixed in there some people saying, ah, we need more time to read the bills. Uh, Most of those people who said we need more time to read the bills didn't take the time to read the bills. They opposed it from the outset. But they at least made a a claim that I'm sympathetic with, that members of Congress should have time to read the bills. They They would layer in substantive challenges on occasion. But in effect, I think the message that comes out of the Republican Party over the past two weeks is we want the issue. We want the politics. The politics are better for us. So while I agree that, you know, absent all of this, the politics were, were probably better for Republicans, announcing that you think that this issue, which Republicans have made the focus, I mean, just arguably the number one issue for Republicans over the last eight years, you have a chance to say, cut daily uh, immigrant crossings in half and you decide against doing that for the politics of it, Democrats might be able to make some hay with that. John, I want to give you the last word here. 
Uh, yeah, you know, this might be naive that I'm still so interested in the policy debate, but I, I just am deeply frustrated that there was never a committee hearing where this would all be, this would all come out and it would all come very clear to what extent there were legitimate policy disagreements, to what extent it was political, you know, in an adversarial setting where you have um, experts. I've, I've spent hours, you know, trying to talk to people on the other side, you know, people like Mark Krikorian, who's a very very strongly against this bill, you know, delve, talking to people who argue, well, you know, the, the president actually has a sweeping authority. Section 212F in the Immigration and Nationality Act says he can uh, remove any any class of it, migrants, you know, that, that he sees fit for national security reasons. Now, the courts in 2018, or the, not, not the Supreme Court, but the lower courts have said, no, there's actually other parts of the INA. Sarah, you can correct me on the law here. Um, and the, you know, the Krikorian types, they say, well, actually, we think that once this got back up to the Supreme Court, uh, they would they would you know say that actually yeah this power is really sweeping and that Joe Biden screwed up by removing remain in Mexico um, obviously that's a, that's a negotiation with a foreign country you know whether Mexico would actually agree to keep people um, at, at these numbers uh, is really remains to be seen but again there's 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 so much frustration because there is an interesting policy debate that no one really wants to have you know if we, if they wanted to have this they would have had it over the course of several weeks in public rather than just, you know, pull the trigger, kill it, show that, that it's dead this week. So anyway. Can I can I say something real quick on that? I mean, this is to me is the best argument the uh the sort of opponents of this deal have, which is um this is a perfect example of the way leadership in the Republican Senate likes to do everything behind closed doors and then present it and say, come on, now come on, Republicans in the Senate, we gotta vote for this. Um I I can sympathize with that. Um, the problem is, is that uh, I don't believe that the the the, the loudest voices uh, who who espouse that view um, actually believe it. I don't think that if there were an open debate that that they would actually engage in it in good right. faith. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but but that's that to me is the problem. It's why it's so frustrating for people like John who who are interested in this. And and I have to say that the the it, it seems that. Whether or not the politics of this work out for, you know, better for Republicans um, or not, I, I do think we have a responsibility to call out exactly what what we've just been describing, which is that the Republicans are explicitly uh, going at, saying this is this is political. This is why we're doing this. Um, it, it does seem that in the current era, Republicans uh, embrace kind of. Uh, uh, Machiavellian politics on the things that don't matter, <laughs> on the things that are like that are like we win or we've owned the libs or like we have a majority, and on the things that do matter, the actual policies that they run on. And I know this sounds naive and sort of eggheady, but like, um, like that's where like the 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 ugly, dirty, you know, gross stuff of politics should be happening to actually get something. Um, and and that's the point at which. At which uh, Republicans uh, sort of throw up their hands and say, "We don't want to do any of this." That's where they sort of get their principles. It's um, that. Sorry, I know you said give the John the last word. That's my last word on this. I'll, I'll, can I have one more last word? Yeah. No, wait. Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I have the last word now? Too? No, John, you can have the last word. But let me just make let me just make a point. So let's let's be clear. I, I, it's not that I think Democrats have behaved admirably in this in this situation. Either. I mean, these are the same Democrats who for three years told us there was no crisis and suddenly said, how dare you stop this legislation that solves this crisis that we said 20 minutes ago didn't exist? I mean, bad faith all around. Democrats deserve to be condemned for this. I think you can point to specific Biden policies that exacerbated the problems that he inherited. All of that is true. I don't think there's there's any question about that. And Democrats deserve to be condemned for that. But if you look at what the way that Republicans have handled this. And you go to the, the to the argument that that John said, you know, Mark Krikorian and, and others are making, and I'm not speaking specifically to, to Krikorian's argument here, but sort of broadly that Joe Biden has these authorities. He could be doing these things. He's not doing them. It's worth pointing out that there's now sort of murmurings out of the White House that Biden is going to take a stronger executive hand to implement some of these things. So there's there's a point to be made there. But at the same time, you know who said Congress has to be the body that drives immigration reform in order for it to be lasting? Donald J. Trump made that argument. 
So, of course, if you can strengthen the hand of the president to solve the problem that your party has been saying is the biggest problem in the country for the past eight years, even if it's not perfect, because there's no legislation that's perfect, don't you do it? Skipping to a different part of GOP politics, the Nevada primary, such as it was happened, maybe, Mike, you can fill us in on a little bit of that. But uh, Nikki Haley was beat out by none of the above, sparking what I think is the best slogan of any political campaign ever. Nobody beats Nikki. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so let me try to give a quick explanation of this. Um, Nevada as a state has uh, as it by law requires presidential primaries uh, for for the parties any party that wants to hold a presidential uh, uh election has to have has to have these primaries um and that was on Tuesday the state republican party in Nevada uh changed their rules and said we wanted to have a caucus um and we wanted to have uh, a, a sort of a little it's not quite like the Iowa caucuses but um the the sort of small meetings across the state to reward our delegates for the Republican National Convention. Um, this was against uh, state law, essentially. Um, I, I I don't think they're they're about to round up the uh, <laughs> the the state chairman of Nevada, but it's, it's sort of against the 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 law in Nevada required this primary. Um, that was the, the the contest that Nikki Haley was on the ballot for, along with some other people who are no longer in the race, like Mike Pence um, and Tim Scott. Uh, but the Republican Party of Nevada held this is is holding this on on Thursday. We're recording this on Thursday. It's happening uh, today. Uh, this uh, this caucus that actually rewards the delegates required uh, some insane amount of money. What, what is it, like fifty thousand dollars? Like or, or, or like. 500 I don't even know what it is. I, I fact check me on that. Some large amount of money from the campaigns in order to qualify for the caucuses. Um the caucuses were set up to uh give Donald Trump a victory. Nikki Haley um uh, did not uh, shell out the money. She wasn't on the ballot for the caucuses. She still lost in the primary. She didn't really compete uh, in it, but a little bit of an embarrassment. Um, and, and, and now we have the caucuses in which we expect Donald Trump to, uh, to, to win handily. But Nikki Haley's still out there and she's still bringing in a lot of money from donors and she's still making a case and frankly, a different case than the one she was making before these primaries really got underway. Uh, Have we written off her effort too soon just because it probably won't result in the eventual nomination in 2024? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think she has a very difficult, nearly impossible task in front of her. And and even if there were an act of God that took Donald Trump out of the the rest of the nominating process, I I think it's likely that you'd see sort of his supporters and MAGA world generally rewrite the rules of the Republican nominating process to prevent Nikki Haley from being the nominee. Um, We've already seen them take steps to try to do that. Uh, I'm confident that they would try to do that again. I, I think we can say without fear of contradiction at this point that they're not the strongest adherence of rules um, at, at, if it means um, eliminating their problems. Um, yeah, I mean, look, jo- John and, and Mike have both at different times written, um, I thought, pretty persuasive reported pieces on why Nikki Haley is is doing what she's doing still. Um, she has claimed uh, that she wants to stay through her uh, home state primary in South Carolina that she wants to stay through Super Tuesday. Uh, I, it does seem like she's enjoying herself. I mean, I think that's one of the the arguments that we that you've heard from from Haley's team and Haley supporters is she's having a good time. She's sort of found her footing. She's enjoying um, her broad critique of Donald Trump, and it certainly is resonating with a chunk of the party. It's not likely to be a majority of the party, um, and. Uh, it's not likely to lead to her nomination, certainly, but she seems to be having fun, fun making it. Um, she does look like she's having a good time. Yeah, m- more than more than most and more than more than Chris Christie did when he he had this sort of a similar role in a in a sort of a tougher, angrier way. Nikki seems to be seems to be liking this. And I know that, John, in, in your piece, that was one of the things you said is she's actually having a good time. This is sort of fun for her. Um, sometimes I think there's a there's a, a tendency in in our business to look at sort of the outcomes and and reason back from the outcomes and say, man, she's not going to win. What is she doing? 
Um, and this doesn't seem to be setting her up for 2028. I mean, if, if you were going to run for 2020, run in 2028, taking on the, the sort of Republican base in the way that she seems to be doing doesn't seem to be the way to do it unless you are making the calculation that Donald Trump will lose in 2024, lose embarrassingly, and that re other Republicans, conservatives will go back to sort of being advocates of small government and principles and what have you. John, last word to you. Uh, I think Steve's really on to something here, which is if you're a politician, I don't think people understand. Politicians are human beings. Can we fact check that actually? Is <laughs> yeah, but they're not quite the same as like normal human beings. Like there's a reason they went into this line of work. They love people. They're all extroverts, but like more than even normal extroverts. They're extra extroverts. They really, really get their energy from people. And so uh, running for president, is grueling. The hours, the staying in crappy hotels across the country, um, the, you know, the wake ups at 4am to do morning TV hits. And then, you know, you got to drive at the end of the night, and it's 1am by the time you get to the next crappy hotel. Um, that part's grueling. But they love all the people and the events and the movement and the constantness of it. Um, so you know, is Nikki out there having fun? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think she's she's a real person. She's a real extrovert. You know, she she's not a lizard person. She's having a lot of fun. Uh, and I think, you know, I mean, why is she doing it? Yeah, I think she has nothing to lose. I mean, she, you know, like you said, she's she's going out there. She's she's building up a, a, a base of admirers and supporters for whatever she wants to do, even if it's not in politics to come next. In my in my first piece I wrote a couple of weeks ago, I did examine the possibility, you know, hey, is she actually making herself more attractive as a VP pick for Trump. And I know that there's all sorts of reasons that he wouldn't do it. He wants a defense lawyer. But just yesterday, a Wisconsin, a Marquette University law school poll, one of the gold standard of Wisconsin showed uh, Trump 49, Biden 49 in Wisconsin. And the same pollster shows Haley 57, Biden 41. I mean, she is she is appealing to a really big slice of, you know, these suburban, you know, college educated, independent, you know, moderate Republicans, uh, you know, whether she I, I, I think it is not much less likely the possibility that she would ever be VP uh, it sort of became moot after I wrote my article when she was asked about the E. Jean Carroll case and finally said, oh, yeah, I totally trust the jury. Um, and I don't think you can quite walk. You can walk back voodoo economics as George H. W. Bush did with Reagan, uh, but saying, "Yeah, I trust the jury that uh, the the that the presidential nominee uh, committed heinous sexual abuse against the, more likely than not in a civil case." I think I think that's one thing you can't have your VP saying. But um, whatever it is, she you know she's she's enjoying herself. She's going to see it through and being runner up, being number two. Um, you know, if Ron DeSantis finished at 45 percent in New Hampshire, he sure as heck would have stuck it out, even though, you know, these people ran when they thought they had one in a thousand chance of being president. So why not stick it out when you've got one in a hundred chance that, I don't know, something happens to Trump with legally or his age uh, and you've got some delegates, you roll into the convention, you know, you've got some wind behind your sails. So, so yeah, I think that she, there's just no reason to drop out. There's no downside for her. All right, let's move on to our next topic. Mike, you and I have been spending our free time, putting that in quotes, reporting on the collision of Donald Trump's legal problems and his political future, and Joe Biden's for that matter. We're expecting actually the report from special counsel Rob Herr on Joe Biden's mishandling of classified information R really any hour now, today, tomorrow. Um, uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland saying the report has finished and he'll be um, transmitting it to Congress soon. But this week, we had the D.C. Circuit, a unanimous three-judge panel, reject Donald Trump's claim that he was immune from prosecution by Jack Smith for election interference um, in the run-up to January 6th. It's, uh, you know, not surprising that that was the result. I think that, though, what people have missed, it was sort of this, like, gleefulness on the left of, like, aha, he's not immune. Now he will go to trial tomorrow. And that ain't it, man. <laughs> uh, the D.C. Circuit actually had an interesting order that came out uh, like minutes later that people didn't pay a lot of attention to. Or if they did, they thought it was also a good thing. But they're missing why the D.C. Circuit felt the need to put out this order. So the order said our mandate will issue, meaning the actual effect of this opinion will go into effect Monday, February 12th, unless Donald Trump wants to ask the Supreme Court 
to stay his trial, basically, in which case we'll just hold off until the Supreme Court says one way or the other whether he's going to have a trial while he's appealing to the Supreme Court. However, if he seeks review by the rest of the judges on the D.C. Circuit, called en banc review, then the mandate issues immediately and Judge Chuck can, can set the trial immediately. And again, everyone's like, aha, see, they're preventing him from delaying this. Yeah, kind of. First of all, I'm not sure any of that flies. But more importantly, no, they're telling you how much delay there is left that he can pull now. Um, there's basically three things that a uh, appellant, the person who lost their appeal, can do after losing at the circuit court. They can ask for the panel to rehear it. Why a panel would rehear it, nobody knows. I think it's a really weird move that people do sometimes. They can ask for the whole court to rehear it, all the judges together, you know, 15 or so on the DC circuit. And then after both of those are done, then they've got 90 days to ask the Supreme Court to hear it. And then after that, the Supreme Court can ask for the views of the other side. And then they think about whether they want to take it. I mean, Months and months and months. So even if Donald Trump has to skip directly to the Supreme Court, he's still got months. So look, I don't see the the chances that any of Donald Trump's trials uh, were going to trial before the election. I've said we're always below 50 percent. That number is creeping down precipitously this week. Yes, I will. I will object sort of practically and say it does. I think it is possible that the the New York uh, criminal uh, trial will, I mean, now now there's sort of an open lane here for the next couple of months for Alvin Bragg's case, uh, uh, the hush money uh, case, uh, which is a criminal case, to move forward. So we could see a trial uh, in New York, uh, which it has long been seen as sort of politically and, and perhaps legally uh, on the shakiest ground um, for, for getting Trump. Um, uh, for for sort of bringing him to heel. Um, I don't know. Look, I, I do not pretend to be a lawyer, even on podcasts, but I, I'm a little more open than I think you are to the idea that we could still have this trial. I mean, it's, it's a question that I have still, which is um, wh- what, uh, what uh, at, at a certain point, um, are the courts going to tolerate from the Trump team uh, these continuous uh, politically motivated efforts to slow things down. Um, the the problem here for me is that everybody's sort of politically compromised here. Jack Smith wants to get this uh, this D.C. election interference case off the ground before the election. Donald Trump wants to wants to delay it till past the election. Um, you know, th- at a certain point, from a layman's perspective. Um, the cards can't all be in Donald Trump's hands. You may differ on this, Sarah, but but if if Chutkin is able to set a trial date, uh, let's say in early summer, it, that that doesn't seem entirely out of the realm of possibility. And um, uh, why why won't that happen? Why won't she be able to set a trial date in early summer? Um, so it's mid February now, and he gets the ninety yep. days to go to the Supreme Court. So he runs those 90 days. Then, and this is, by the way, this is assuming, to your point, Mike, that the Supreme Court does say that they're going to hold off the trial starting until he is able to appeal this to the Supreme Court, if that makes sense, right? There is some chance the Supreme Court could just say like, nope, the trial can go on and we'll deal with your appeal whenever it happens or not, but might as well have the trial. And I think we have to consider that as as a real possibility. Maybe you think that's unlikely, but I think... It's it's in these it's in the decision tree of what could happen. It's in the decision tree. I think it's very, very unlikely because, you know, it's very easy for all of us to see this as the political machinations around the election. And he just wants to delay everything. But this is also the normal course for basically everyone who loses an appeal. You know, sometimes they're going to want things to move really quickly and sometimes they're going to want things to move really slowly based on their own interests. You know, especially for criminal defendants, if you're not in jail you're pretty good with continuing to not be in jail. So wanting to delay things, not unusual. And so to treat Donald Trump differently is to treat him special, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, So I think the Supreme Court absolutely will be considering how they would treat a normal person 
who, yeah, they want to run out the clock on their appeal because maybe they don't have to pay the $500 million judgment against them until the Supreme Court rules or whatever else. So that's just not unusual. That being said, it is unusual to get to go up to the Supreme Court before you've had your trial. And I think there's been some confusion about this because most criminal defendants, you have your trial and then you've got your appeals after you're convicted. You know, they shouldn't have used this evidence against me or the prosecutor did this or this wrong or this juror was biased, whatever that is. That happens after, right? So why is Donald Trump getting to go up beforehand? Doesn't that mean he's being treated special? The answer to that is no, but it's also not... (laughs) It's a little hard to explain without sounding like a total egghead weirdo um, and going into the precedent of Midland Asphalt. Why yeah. stop now, Sarah? <laughs> that's that's to- that always <laughs> stops, Sarah. So can I jump in? Can I jump in with a with, with a uh, sort of a level setting basic question as a stand in for for our readers who might not be or listeners who might not be following every twist and turn of all this? Um, going back to a point that that um, that Mike, that you made. Um, so Sarah suggests that this is likely to be delayed. Um, you know, that, that some of this really could get pushed out to the point where, you know, we don't see these things even before the election. There's been a recent polling that suggests most voters, including most Republicans are not paying careful attention to this. Do not, did not even know about the details of, uh, of these cases. And Mike, as you said, this seems to potentially create a, an open path for the Alvin Bragg case, the weakest, I think, on the merits, the the most uh, political uh, on appearances to sort of live in the spotlight, to move forward and live in the spotlight. One of the arguments that we've heard, and I think it's true, about the indictments and the galvanizing effect that they had for Republican voters um, looking at Donald Trump, the voters who were paying attention to this, the activist base of the Republican Party, is that because the Bragg case went first and it was the weakest and the most political, um, they rallied to Donald Trump's side and said, this is crazy. Uh, This shouldn't be happening. And Trump benefited tremendously from the fact that that was the first of these and that the more serious and substantive cases with respect to the the, the fake electors, the, the classified documents, were then seen through the prism of this political triple bank shot case in, in New York. Is he getting lucky again? Well, yeah. I mean, he's uh, don't you know about the uh, the various uh, voodoo uh, rituals that he's done? He gets he get, they all go his way. Uh, it, it goes back to something that happened in the 70s. Now, I, like. I I see what you're saying. I've actually I've been more skeptical than maybe anybody on the podcast uh, has been about uh, the counterfactual. If if they had indicted him on the documents case first, that then the, then Republican primary voters would have taken the indictments uh, uh, of and, and and the criminal potential criminality of Donald Trump more seriously. Um, the the Bragg indictment just happened to be sort of the most politically motivated, uh, but. I kind of don't buy it seems like Republican primary voters were primed to want to take Donald Trump's side and to believe that any criminal uh, uh, any any effort to bring him up on criminal charges um, was uh, unfair and targeted and that they needed to rally around him. So I actually think but I'll stipulate the point that that the Bragg case did sort of do that uh, for Republican primary voters. I do wonder if. This opening for the Bragg case and and sort of laying it all out, that's kind of this gross stuff with payments to Stormy Daniels and whether they were hush money and all this stuff. Um, I I do wonder if it's a good look for Donald Trump with a general election audience. That, to me, is the big difference. Republican primary voters live in a different world than general election voters do. And um and and I wonder if the details of that case of hearing every every time you hear about Donald Trump, let's say in the months of you know April and May when he's wrapping things up, if not already wrapped it all up uh, for the Republican nomination, if everything we hear about him is about hush money to a porn star, um, uh, you know I'm not saying I know that that's how it how it will go that his numbers will drop precipitously in these general election polls i'm just saying we don't know uh and it hasn't really been tested um and so it does bring up some interesting political questions about the effect uh of sort of opening this up for the most politically motivated but kind of the most salacious of all of the uh of the uh trials and obviously 
Next week, we'll have the hearing for Fonnie Willis, the Georgia... We didn't even talk about that. Yeah. ...prosecutor. Speaking of Trump getting lucky. Oh, I mean, that that to me, when you say Trump getting lucky... He wasn't the only one getting lucky. <laughs> wow. Like, <laughs> hey, wait. Just saying. I, I'm here. This is not supposed to go off the rails when I'm here. Oh, Isn't I'm that sorry. the joke? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't help. It's like, I, I couldn't I, help myself. I'm the, I'm the, the no fun whistle. The I'm the scold. <laughs> And you guys can have fun when I'm gone. I get this. You know, I, I didn't listen to that podcast, obviously, when I wasn't there. <laughs> but I get it. We can only use, I, I read the employee handbook, and we can only use innuendo from the 1930s. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's, there's a clause in there, I'm pretty sure. Mike should be well prepared for that. He's a, he's a 70-year-old our, our trapped in a 38-year-old's body. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Bonnie Willis, the prosecutor in Georgia, was accused by one of Trump's co-defendants, Mike Roman, of being in a uh, relationship with one of the special counsels that she hired. And look, there's two things that that's going to turn on that Mike and I are watching for next week. Uh, Fonnie Willis has now filed with the court under penalty of perjury that the relationship did not start before he she hired him as a special counsel on that case. Uh, and two that he is compensated the same as the other two special counsels that she hired. If either of those two things turn out to be false, um, not only is it a big problem for all of this case moving forward, it will be a huge professional problem for Fonnie Willis, who will have lied to the court. Um, Mike Roman's lawyer seems to say that they will have witnesses that will testify that both of those things were false, in fact, that the relationship started years ago and that he is being compensated differently and more than the other two special counsels. Um, so, Mike, I guess, you know, no one's going to really pay attention in the weeds of this, but they're definitely paying attention, I think, to the swirl to once again, like whether it's Michael Avenatti or Fonnie Willis or Alvin Bragg, the people who go after Donald Trump are, you know, they're not just not pure as the driven snow. They're like the greasy oil black sludge on the side, as it turns out. And it makes Donald Trump look like the victim. Yeah, that's right. And and uh, this is really this is an area where Donald Trump really has uh, uh, keeps winning by having the worst enemies um, or from his perspective, the best enemies. Um, I, I, it's you know, I think there's a path for Fonnie Willis to even even if whatever this this uh, evidence suggests um for her to essentially say you can't prove that we were in a relationship because uh the two of us define when we were in a relationship i don't know i mean i'm, I'm saying i'm saying there's a way she can lawyer her way out of this and stay on the case because that's the question right will she be disqualified from prosecuting the case uh in which in which case uh a whole new prosecutor has to be appointed. That's a long process. Um, and uh, they get a chance to look at the evidence in Fulton County again and decide whether to change anything in the prosecution. Um, but even if she holds on to this, um, you know, this was seen generally as uh, maybe a little uh, uh, ambitious to go this RICO route uh, to sort of a ch charge all these Trump people and Trump with racketeering on election interference. Uh, but but the substance of it was seen as, yeah, there's there, there's substance here. Um, I think that no matter what happens to Fonnie Willis, that goes away from this point forward and Trump wins again. All right. Last up, uh, not worth your time. I just want to be clear here. I wanted to talk about the first quasi moon to get a name, Zeus V, uh, Venus's quasi moon now officially named by a typo. Basically, its actual name was 2002VE. And an artist put it on a map for children's like, you know, decal wallpaper, on, you know, behind the crib. And instead of twos, thought it was Zeus and uh, named it Zeus V on the map. And that child's map happened to be uh, another podcast, uh, Latif Nasser from Radio Lab. And he was like, wait, there's a moon around Venus that I didn't know about? He contacts NASA. NASA's like, no, there's not. And they go on this wild hunt for what Zeus V is, only to find out it was this typo. But it ends happily because now Zeus V really does have a name. 
I'm so excited. It's definitely worth your time. Steve, don't you agree? No, I mean, I love that Sarah said, I really wanted to do this thing and then spent two hours, <laughs> two, two minutes doing <laughs> doing this this thing about the lunar kofeve. I guess that's what this, this thing is, yeah. right? <laughs> So no, you're not doing that. <laughs> We're changing. First of all, I need to I need to point out, and neither John nor Mike picked up on this, which I suppose speaks well of them. But moments after Sarah talked about only allowing 1930s innuendo, she said the Fonnie Willis case will turn on these two things. Oh my, Steve! Yeah, Look pretty at that. pretty bad. Look at that. Pretty bad. Nothing gets by me. So uh, we are we we are not going to talk about uh, about Sarah's moon stuff. Um, instead, we need to make fun of Sarah for um, this something that happened yesterday. I, I'm sure our our most perceptive uh, podcast listeners will note that we spent I don't know it probably wasn't half of the podcast, but you know, well over a third of the podcast on things that might more appropriately fit on another podcast that I'm told the dispatch uh, sponsors. Um, <laughs> this podcast is called Advisory Opinions. Um, it's been uh, it's been taking place for a while now, uh, I'm told. And uh, and it has some listeners, um, including some listeners who are um high profile people in the, the conservative legal world. Um, the good news is I found, I found Nerds. out all about this podcast because I read it in a New Yorker profile, um, <laughs> which is, which made it sound like it actually might be worth listening to. Um, but, but there was a profile uh, about this podcast and our, our, our host hostess here, Sarah Isker in the New Yorker. And it was, I have to say, an incredibly favorable um, profile for a center-right person in what is a pretty left-leaning publication. Um, Sarah, what what was your? We're going to put the, the 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 profile in the the show notes. This New Yorker piece makes it sound like you're sort of the Supreme Court whisperer. And um, while I, I know about your um, your contacts in, in the legal world, you are as plugged in as uh, as this profile makes you seem. It, it helps us understand what's going on uh, and helps us do reporting on this. Is it the case that you're really running things at the Supreme Court as a casual reader <laughs> might, <laughs> might might take away from the piece? You know, I'm not running things at the Supreme Court because uh, it described me as a gadabout and I had to Google that. Had never heard that word before. I like that. It was I, it, that that word jumped out at me. Is that is that a common just riff on gadfly? What is a gadabout? A gadabout is um, uh, again, I'm, I'm reading to you now from what I found on Google, but someone who flits about a lot of places um, in a lot of circles. You don't deny that. Yeah. You're it's a, a gut about. Description, I think. You're a gut about. You're the bee's knees. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never seen you flit, but I mean, you are in lots of circles. I'm a flitter, Steve. <laughs> yeah. I flit all the time. No, it was really fun. So, I mean, this is like, what was cool about this to me is that the reporter is a longtime listener. He's listened to every episode of the podcast. His sister's a lawyer. And so he got into it so he could have these conversations with his sister. And so... To have sort of one of our listeners and be like, oh, I'm going to write a profile about this so that other people know about this podcast. For me, it was actually cooler than just having like some reporter who heard about it and like wanted to write some profile. I think that's why um, a certain love of the pod comes across is because he was a podcast listener first and an AO fan first and then decided to write the profile. So I'm incredibly grateful to Kay. Um, he spent like six months working on this piece. And, um, you know, I, it's awkward. Uh, I feel really weird when people say nice things about me. And I will tell you, like, I'm sure <laughs> this is the funny thing about podcasts, I guess, is I can't see everyone listening. And so I feel like I can just actually say things that I would never say if I could see people's faces. But I'll tell you my like actual reaction yesterday was weird. And I don't know, like, not dark, but it just feels very strange. 
you're not like, yeah, cool. You're like, oh, I don't know. This is like really weird. And, uh. <laughs> um, Scott was like checking on me. He's like, I don't understand. Like you're acting like something really bad happened today. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm super grateful because I feel like he captured the joie de vivre of the gad about life. <laughs> He did. I think he did did a good job from what I'm told, from what I'm told the the podcast. Right. John and Mike, did you guys know about this podcast? Have you ever have you ever listened to this before? Uh, you know, I feel like my podcast player like it stumbled on it at some point and I like was driving in the car and I couldn't change anything. It might have so, been recommended um, for you because you listen to the dispatch podcast, right? I mean, it makes sense. Right. Possibly uh, possibly. No, I it's uh, I in all seriousness and and it is it is a great podcast. It was very clear that uh, the author is a listener just yeah. from reading it um, and 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 had that, as you said, Sarah, love for it. I mean, uh, I um, I I find this particular writer not. Like, of course, what I want to do is now direct our attention to the guy who wrote the article, not the <laughs> yes. subject of the article, of course. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> Kay's incredible. He normally writes great. about, I he mean, writes not, about music. Writes about music. Like his profile of George Strait. Yes. Like is the other Texan that he's written about. So it's like me and George Strait. Like, yeah, it's like the two of you. In fact, I, I was, w I was going back and I, I emailed him about that George Strait profile, <gasps> whenever that was like eight years ago, just yeah. to tell him how much I loved it. Um, and uh, not to make this all about me, but he wrote back to say that he was a reader of mine uh, back when I was at the Weekly Standard. <laughs> and uh, and so I I feel like uh, for a sort of for a lefty rag like the New Yorker, which I, I love the New Yorker, but it's it's a you know it's a left uh, wing kind of uh, opinion journal. Um, he seems to be. Uh, he seems to be conservative, curious, um, uh, interested in what uh, the people on the center right have to say. So um, he's uh, he's he's great. And go read that George Strait profile by him, by the way. It's it's so it's so good. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes, too. Wait, Mike, I have an important question. This is serious because the joke about Steve not listening to the podcast is funny because it's correct, true. Correct. Steve does not listen to the podcast. You just sort of said that you did. And I'm actually very curious because. I, like, I want to call you out right now. Do you actually listen to the podcast? I'm not a regular listener. <laughs> and but on because here's the thing. I cannot I cannot understand when you guys dig in to what's happening in, a, you know, in a state uh, you know, court appellate court for some, some case like that. I can't I can't get into it. But on the big stuff, whenever there's a, like whenever there's a Supreme Court uh, a, a big Supreme Court case like AO was the first place I go. I remember sitting, um, I think it was sitting on a beach when uh, when Dobbs uh, came down. And the first place I went to was to hear you and David uh, talking about it. I think I even I definitely listened to it when uh, the Dobbs leak happened. Uh, because I wanted to, I wanted to see what you guys, what the, what tea leaves you could read and all of that stuff. It's, it's a, it's a great show. Um, so that's, that's what I think of that. John, have you ever listened to it? I, 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 at the beginning of this podcast, I mentioned AO. I said, if anybody wants a really in-depth discussion of the policies actually at stake with asylum policy, I would say go to the, what would it be that January 30th episode? Um, I thought that was great. And that is the kind of, <laughs> it's just deeply frustrating that that kind of in-depth discussion was not actually held in the greatest deliberative <laughs> body that you have to go to. This, you know, not even the flagship podcast. Uh, um, this obscure niche podcast. Yeah. It's the new greatest deliberative body. Let's let's call AO the new greatest deliberative body. Well, let me let me protest. I'll, I'll, let me end by saying it is not true. Sir, I just have to fact check you on this because unlike whatever that other podcast is, we believe in truth and facts here on the Dispatch podcast. Uh -huh. It's not accurate to say that I don't listen to the to advisory opinions. I have listened to advisory opinions um, on multiple occasions. I know occasions. you listened to one episode because I got in trouble. Like you were like, on hey. On multiple <laughs> occasions. Yeah, well, actually, this is sort of an interesting, I mean, this is, a, this is probably way too in the weeds and people won't be that interested in it. But, you know, it, it's funny as I was reading that, that profile yesterday, um, I, I was thinking, man, am, am I glad I didn't push Sarah and David to do the podcast I wanted them to do, honestly, right? I mean, my podcast was much more sort of like, can you, 
take these complicated legal issues um, from Supreme Court on down and explain them first and foremost as your first job to non legal listeners. And, you know, I, I would say in, in a way that's sort of been typical of the way that you've handled me from the beginning, Sarah, you kind of nodded in my direction and then just did your own thing anyway. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and while I, I do think all jokes aside, I do think one of the, the things uh, that, that advisory opinions does well is it does often stop and say, okay, for non-lawyers here, this is what this means. And that is helpful. But you've also, I mean, you call it le legal nerdery. Do you know we say it that way? Because a lot of lawyers actually also don't remember that stuff. But we try to be yeah. nice to them and say we're doing it for the non-lawyers when in fact we're doing it for the lawyers who just like do other okay, stuff. Okay, so no. this might <laughs> actually be interesting to our, our, our listeners. So this, in, 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 in four and a half years of, of doing the dispatch, this is sort of one of the key insights of, of the entire business, of the entire enterprise, is we do that with the morning dispatch. We do that with a lot of the pieces that we write. We introduce these explanatory elements. We often tell people, take an extra sentence or two and explain the context here. And, you know, we do it in Dispatch Politics newsletter. We do it elsewhere. And the number of people in Washington who work in these areas who say, one of the reasons I like what you all do so much is because you take the time to explain this. Um, it, it, I, I get that feedback regularly. I got it at a dinner the other night and it's the most gratifying feedback we get about everything we do. But I think you're, you're right, Sarah, you know, it is just helpful to take that time to, to explain it. But having said that you and David took the podcast in, in a direction that, that wasn't the, the thing that I sort of urged you to do. And, and, and it really has, has worked. So kudos to you. Uh, I do think the profile captured the spirit of advisory opinions, uh, at least the episode I listened to. And, and, <laughs> and I think it's, I'm proud that it's one of the four best podcasts we, we put out here at the dispatch. And with that, thank you all so much for listening to this podcast. Um, but yeah, no, definitely go listen to AO ditch this one. This one's the worst. Ooh. Um, no, thank you all so much for listening. And we'll have so much to talk about next week because it, I don't know, it feels like we're in this season of news every day. Um, it, the hits just keep on coming. So more next week. Ciao.